In this video, I'm going to talk about emissivity and albedo as it applies to the Earth. Please read the success criteria I plan to cover during this video. Let me just remind you what a black body is because this relates to emissivity. If we have a black body, and this is what Planck was working with when he did his first quantum theory, he said a black body would be an object that absorbs all the EM radiation that lands on it. And that means that it's going to look black because it doesn't reflect any light back to our eyes. Also notice that it's going to emit everything that it absorbs. If it was perfect as a black body, we're going to say its emissivity is 1. And if it reflected everything and didn't absorb anything, we would say it was 0. Now, albedo is not quite the opposite calculation, but it is an opposite idea. Because if something doesn't absorb it, we're going to say here the albedo is how much it scatters. So how much of that power that landed on it did it not absorb? It scattered. Now, here we've got some average values for the Earth. Now, obviously, it's going to change with different factors. Clouds are pretty good at scattering the light that comes in from the sun. Oceans are not very good and snow, which is highly reflective, has a very high albedo value. We do have some differences along the earth as well. In our higher altitudes, because they're closer to the poles, they tend to be more covered in snow, so those areas do tend to have a higher albedo. The amount of solar energy reflected in each hemisphere ends up being basically identical, so this is kind of cool. Now, it's not because of what's landing on there, although the intensity of the sun is stronger at the equator and the intensity is weaker at the poles. The southern hemisphere does tend to have more clouds that scatter the light, but the northern hemisphere has more of a landmass, which reflects more than the water. So. Let's do a few examples of emissivity and albedo. First of all, outline two ways in which human activities can alter the albedo of the Earth. The first one that comes to mind is the melting ice. So we do have climate change due to human activities, with greenhouse gases increasing the average temperature of the Earth, causing more of the ice to melt. For example, the glaciers retreating and the polar ice caps getting smaller. Remember, ice has a very large albedo, so if we have less ice, this will reduce the albedo. Another one would be deforestation. This will affect the amount of water vapor in the air. So if I have less water vapor in the air, I have less scattering, and this would reduce the albedo. Another thing to think about would be smoke from forest fires, which could be uh, caused by human activities. I know that there's been many countries lately with a lot of forest fires, which some are caused by lightning or things like that, but many are still caused by human activities, typically ones where people don't realize that they've caused the fire. For example, throwing a cigarette butt out of a car, and they don't see that it's, you know, after they've left, it's caused a fire. So there's smoke, but there's also, I'm going to say P and particular matter 10, very small fine powder into the air, typically caused by a lot of building processes and things like that. This will cause more scattering. This would increase the albedo. And finally, another one that people might not be thinking about is roads. Um, if you think about the amount of pavement we've used now to cover this earth, of which it's mostly black or dark gray, this is going to absorb more or scatter less. It's definitely causing heating effects in our major cities. So let's do another example. We have a block of ice at zero degrees placed in the middle of an empty field. It has a surface area of 15 meters square and a thickness of five meters. It's a pretty big block of ice, say three meters by five meters. The sun supplies a thermal energy at a rate of 300 watts per meter to the surface of the earth. And we have the albedo of the melting ice being 0.8. Show that the energy required to melt the ice is 2.5 gigajoules. Well, let's start with getting the mass of the ice that we have. 
that would be the density times the volume. Now we should know that the density is 1 gram per centimeter cubed or 1,000 kilograms per meter cubed. If I'm going to times that by the volume, that will be the area, which is 15, times the thickness, 0.5. Now I'm going to pick up my handy dandy calculator. That's going to give me 7,500 kilograms. Now we know the equation for melting ice. That's going to be Q equals ML and L being the latent heat diffusion, which they've given us here. Don't forget, double check these units. This says kilojoules per kilogram. So if I have 750 kilograms and I multiply that by 3, 3, 4, I'm going to go times 10 to the power 3 joules per kilogram. And again, my handy dandy calculator tells me this is 2.505. Now, times 10 to the power 9 joules. And times 10 to the power 9 is a gigajoule. So that's approximately 2.5 gigajoules. So let me do B over here in a different color. Determine the estimate of a time taken to melt the ice. Now, remember, if I want the time taken and I have the amount of heat I need, because I have here the intensity, I'm going to be using that to help me get the power is the energy over time. Now, if we think about the power we need, not all of this is coming to my ice. I'm only going to get 1 minus 0 0.8 because that's how much gets scattered and then times 300 and times the area because remember this is watts per meter squared so if I want just the amount of watts my power I'm going to have to multiply that by 15 that's going to equal my energy which was 2.505 times 10 to the power 9 joules per time if I rearrange that, my time will be this value here divided by this one. And if I pick up my calculator, I'm going to get 2.78 times 10 to the power 6. And this will be seconds, because remember, inside a watt are going to be kilograms, meters, and seconds, because that's what's hidden inside these joules. And if I want to put that into, say, hours, that's going to be 700 and 73 hours. Now if I look at all my numbers I probably should have just kept it to two significant figures but I've just left three here. And example three. It says here are heaters used to heat a room to 25 degrees. The heater itself has a temperature of 200 degrees and an emissivity of 0 0.9. It also has a surface area of 3.2 meters cubed. That should be squared. What is the net power generated by the heater? Now, one of the things I need to point out is the net power of the generator is going to be whatever power it absorbs minus whatever power it emits. Now, in our data booklet, we have the following equation. Now, this is luminosity. That's another word for power. And notice that it's just saying the power is just going to be the Stefan Boltzmann constant times the area and temperature the power for. But one of the things about this is it's usually written in this way when we talk about stars. And we usually assume that they are black bodies. Therefore, the emissivity equals 1. But in this case, for our power, we should have emissivity times sigma a t to the power 4. So my net power, it will be the emitted power of the heater minus what it absorbs. And well, it's going to absorb the power because of the temperature of the room. So this is the power that's landing on it, and this is what it's going to give off. Now, if I talk about the emission, that's going to be E sigma, its area, and 
the temperature here is going to be 200. I'm just going to write it like this first. Here's what's going to absorb. Because remember, we've got emissivity. It's not a black body. And then this is going to be my room temperature. I'm going to collect some like terms out here so I can make myself a little bit easier. E sigma A. And then this is going to be 200 to the power of 4 minus 25 to the power of 4. So 0.9 times my favorite constant, 5, 6, 7, 8, minus 8 times the area, which was 3.2 times these numbers. And if I pick up my handy dandy calculator, I'm going to get 6.9 times 10 to the power 3 watts, or just under 7 kilowatts. Now the reason I put that question number 3 in there is let's talk about the Earth. One of the things I said about the heater is that it was going to be absorbing some energy and emitting some energy. And if they weren't in balance, I had a net power that it was given off. Now if we talk about the radiation that's coming from the sun, some gets reflected and scattered due to the albedo of the atmosphere, some gets might be reflected from the surface, and some will get absorbed. And some of this light will then leave the Earth because we know that anything with a temperature will emit radiation. Now, the Earth used to be in balance. The amount that it was getting back from the Sun and through all these other processes was equaling what was being given off back into the universe. And what's happened right now is that we are not letting as much leave the Earth as what we used to. What does that mean? Well, it means that we don't have a net balance. And so the power means that more is coming in that's going to be leaving, and we're going to need a new equilibrium. And the only way that's going to happen is if we have a larger average temperature of the Earth. And so please watch my other video on the enhanced greenhouse effect to see how we're changing things on the Earth using emissivity and albedo. Please read the success criteria one more time and hopefully you can say yes to these pieces.